Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to the end of our participants here in Brussels and to the participants in the United States. My name is Maria van Breda. I'm the Educates Coordinator and your host today. Before I give the floor to the moderator, Catalane de Meijer, uh, I will tell you a little more, bit more about Educate. Educate is the Belgian platform for education and development, and about 50 Belgian actors, organizations, which are working in the education sector are Educate community. Uh, we have the pleasure and the honor to have with us today Rosemary Nembos and Professor Eddie Walakira from Uganda as part of their visit to Belgium and Ho West during this week. Uh, we have foreseen a Q&A with the audience and the participants in the Zoom session can ask questions via the chat box. Uh, I also want to highlight that the session will be recorded. So uh, if you want to ask a question here in the room, speak out loud and clearly. So let's start the session by introducing shortly the moderator of the day, uh, Kathleen de Meijer, who is the Global Engagement Officer from Hal West. And um, I will give you the floor, Kathleen. Thank you. So first of all, I want to thank Educate for having us here uh, today and for organizing this interesting Connect and Learn event. With our partners from Angels Care Center in Uganda and Makarere University. We are happy to have Ms. Rosemary Nambozi and Eddie Walakira here with us today to share their expertise and experience in the field of special education for children with special needs. So for the West, Uganda is one of the first countries in which the West had structural partnerships. It started in 2012 with the Mount of the Moon University in the field of information and communication technology. Recently, we also started the Institutional University Corporation with Mbarara University of Science and Technology on Youth Employment. With Makarere University, we are partner in an Erasmus Plus capacity building in higher education projects on applied human machine learning. But since a few years, we are also expanding our collaboration with Ugandan partners in the field of human and welfare. The collaboration with Rosemary Nambozi and her Angels Care Center started in 2019 with the study program Occupational Therapy. During a visit last year, where my colleagues of Applied Psychology and the Teacher Training visited the center, Ms. Nambozi introduced us to Eddie Wolakira, the head of the Department of Social Work and Social Administration of Makerere University. So we are glad to welcome them here in Belgium to explore future possible collaboration in the field of research and education and student and staff exchange. So I think now I can also present to you Ms. Rosemary Nambozi, the coordinator of Angels Care Center in Uganda, and she will give us an interesting session on special education for children with special needs in Uganda and on parent support groups for inclusive education. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Educate, Genesis, and Hoes for having us in, in Belgium. Of course, it's an honor. But before um, I make my presentation, I'll just uh, request you to watch a four minute video that is going to introduce what I'm going to share. Angels Center for Children with Special Needs is a non-governmental organization founded in 2012 in Wakiso District. Our aim is to reach out to children with neurological disorders through training, equipping and rehabilitation to be able to support them in their physical, emotional and cognitive development to reach their potential goals in life. It is through programs like early learning, therapy and distribution of assistive devices, livelihoods, inclusive education, workforce development, advocacy, networking, food and nutrition that Angels Center has been able to do tremendous work in changing the lives of children with special needs and their families. Hello, my name is Martin. I work with Angels Center in a community-based rehabilitation program. Uh, this is Sissy, a mother to 
to Jen, a five-year-old with cerebral palsy. By the time we met Jen, she was unable to sit independently, she was not able to hold objects, she wasn't able to feed, she was unable uh, to dress up or do any activity. She was dependent on the mother for much of these activities. Thanks to Angel Center and all the partners for changing Jenny's life. Mukasa <laughs> We are so excited to share with you what transpired in 2022. Meet some tender Ronald. Ronald is an eight-year-old boy with cerebral palsy. Before we started working with him, he used to have low self-esteem because of his condition. But now, he's able to socialize freely with his peers in the community. My name is um, Pumuza Damali. I work as a community-based rehabilitation officer. We've been able to allocate Sam Tender Ronald. We made for him an individualized education plan where we have to track his progress under uh, education. This is Martin and I'm with Arthur. Arthur has Down syndrome and is on the Workforce Development Program. At the Angel Center, Arthur, he welcomes students when they arrive in the morning and then he directs the parents on where to go and where to leave the children and how to get them and to get to their teachers. So he's such a tremendous person in doing that. My name is Grace Kavma. I'm a mother to Arthur Senoga. I thank NGOs Center for the great job they've done in the life of Arthur. I'm excited to share with you our, one of our first edition and latest publication that talks about raising a child with Down syndrome. And we are going to launch this book on the 21st of March of 2023 on World Down Syndrome Day. Join us as we share our stories, coping strategies that have been enlisted in the book. And uh, part of the proceeds that come from this book are going towards the, the construction of our vocational block. As Angel Center, we feel in our 10th year, we should equip our children with special needs, vocational skills that will allow them to become more functional and independent in their lives. In 2022, we have seen big milestones. We received support for construction of a modern adaptation sanitation facility that is going to be used by over 83 children and their caregivers. We appreciate our partners who have walked this tremendous journey with us through 2022. Your support and generosity will forever be appreciated. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to go straight to the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, Angel Center is a young government organization that was started in 2012 as a result of raising our own son who has Down syndrome. Okay. So our vision is a society that integrates children with special needs to fully realize their potential. And our mission, we want to be the voice and break the silence of disability in Uganda. If uh, we are to share briefly about the history, like Uganda as a country, one of the biggest challenges we have having a child with disability is looked at as witchcraft. It's something that we don't have clear policies in the country. 
that are helping us to safeguard in terms of child protection when it comes to a child with disability. Uh, and so as Angel Center, we use two different approaches of uh, implementing our program. One of the key approach we have is the center-based approach where children come to the center, they receive therapy, early learning and other services, then they go back to their homes. Then the other approach we use is the community-based rehabilitation. We all know that the future for Africa uh, will be in community inclusion. The only way that we can sustain this is to support our children within their families and within their communities. Okay. Uh, some of the main objectives, what we want to do is to create awareness about the importance and the potential success of stimulating a child with disability. I think it's so important in our country to create awareness because of the stigma that is attached to disability and the cultural taboos that are attached to disability. Then one of the key things we look at is supporting parents with counseling and guidance. Many of them are still struggling with the coping mechanism on how to support the child with special needs within a family setup. And then we also look at building the capacity of parents and also professionals. As a country, we are struggling with having professionals that, have, that, that can provide services for children with disabilities. So we are still struggling a lot uh, in terms of equipping more skills with professionals, for example, speech therapists, occupational therapists, special workers, and so on. And then the biggest challenge, of course, is the social stigma attached to disability. So we need to build strong families that will be able to support their children, but also be resilient to the cultural norms. Then we also need to definitely working with these children. It's so important that um, one of our biggest aim is to give disability in one face. Because right now in our country, it's still looked at as um, a taboo. You know, it's not accepted. So working towards acceptance of every child and looking at the diversity that those children bring on board is one of our aim as Angel Center. So our current programs, uh, briefly, we are looking at early learning. Here in early learning, we talk about, uh, we use the applied behavioral analysis model that uh, uh, when you look at the conditions that we are supporting, we have Down syndrome, autism, cerebral palsy, those are all forms of intellectual disabilities. And then also learning disabilities, the invisible disabilities. I think that's the very hardest disabilities to handle. They are invisible, but they are there. So uh, the home-based individualized education plan or program where every child we come up with a program, the tasks and goals we want to achieve for every child. And then one of our strongest uh, points right now when you look at Angel Center is the workforce development. In the video you saw Arthur. Arthur is um, he's 28 years old and he has Down syndrome, but we have trained him under workforce development. He works with Angel Center and he's our receptionist. When you come to Angel Center, Arthur will welcome you, will ask you to sign in the book. And through that, we have fought stigma in communities because the mother of Arthur, through her support group, tells them that now Arthur works. Arthur no longer stays in the home. Arthur, we put Arthur out of the home. He was hidden in the house for so many years. Arthur never went to school because there was no provision for that. And today, Arthur earns an income. And be, uh, Arthur is diabetic, so he's on daily medication. His income is able to buy him drugs. So the family no longer spends money to buy him drugs. So thanks to the opportunity of creating work. Then we offer therapy and rehabilitation. Definitely there is no way uh, how you are going to work with these children without the support of rehabilitation and therapy. So the center-based therapy is daily Monday to Friday, and the community-based therapy is an outreach.
I'm going to continue your welcome. So what Angel Center does, um, we have two best approaches of rehabilitation. We have the center-based rehabilitation where children come to Angel Center to receive the physiotherapy, the occupational therapy, speech and language. Because we all know that children born with intellectual disabilities, there is some senses, maybe the speech is lacking, maybe the physical development is lacking. And so we also provide the different mobility devices that are needed to support We have the livelihood initiatives for caregivers. Over the years, we have realized as Angel Center that um, families have become a form of abuse for these children and where we've seen cases of mothers giving up on the journey and killing their own children born with disabilities and so we realized that families struggle to cope you know providing the extra burden of having a child with disability within the family um, results from different acts of inhumans like killing the child so we have develop lovely livelihood initiatives where caregivers are linked to organizations that can provide small loans uh, so that they can have do some value addition of the small activities within their home to raise some income to support the children. Uh, water and sanitation as Angel Center, I think one of the biggest challenges we have back home is water access to water, which is very key. You cannot prepare food without water. And most of our children, when you look at household level, if you have a child with a disability, the burden of care increases. So your child will not be able to go and collect water from the closest water project. So as Angel Center, uh, we are trying to campaign and look for partners that can provide water to households that have children with disabilities. And our biggest strength right now is the parent support network. In terms of advocacy and collaborations, we go to the streets of Kampala, we advocate for the government to provide services to our children. Yes, as I explained now, because I talked about the different services, so this is more pictorial. This is the early learning. We have special needs teachers that are supporting our children into early learning. The workforce development, this is where adults with disabilities are able to are linked to different organizations and they are able to work. Uh, I shared about the center-based approach and provision of therapy. Parents come to Angel Center to receive a specific therapy they need. For example, if the challenge is on mobility, we have a physiotherapist who provides the service to your child and then you go back. Um, we have the community-based rehabilitation. This is where now we go to the families. Uh, when COVID broke out, uh, we changed a little bit. We became stronger in communities because now this was the opportunity we had to go into the household and provide the services, but also uh, equip mothers. What we do in the community-based approach, it's a mentorship and coaching program. The therapist coaches the mother on provision of simple therapy activities or services to the child. An example I would give feeding. Most of our children born with cerebral palsy have challenges of feeding and choking with food. So a speech and language therapist goes to that household and supports the caregiver with key uh, areas to focus on when you're feeding the child to avoid choking and death. And then also another key area where physiotherapists have to go to the communities is positioning of the child. How do you position the child to sit in a wheelchair or in a feeding chair? It's very important like that physiotherapists go to households and support mothers on positioning. And in this community-based program, we use the locally available materials, for example, jerry cans or water containers, we cut the jerry can and we 
we put additional assistive devices to help the child sit in a corner without movement and positioning. So every household uses its own assistive device, but locally made without money expenses because also uh, in the African community, access to resources is still so difficult. So this is where we require, let's say students who are interested in coming to Uganda to do internship. That's when we look at creativity and innovation because there is no, uh, you know, solid, you cannot say that A is A, that we can only have a wheelchair in a metallic device. We can have a wheelchair paper made or special chairs for feeding <laughs> papers or using wood or using any form of material. Yeah, this is the water project I, I, I was talking about through our funder, World Massy Fund. Uh, at Angel Center, we now have water full time. Here, you may think this is a small achievement, <clears throat> but in Africa, water is not available all the time. And, uh, and so as Angel Center, because we house in a day, we can have over 100 children and they should have access to water for garden, for cooking, for access to the toilet and, and, and so on. So our water project is such is in such a manner that we all know that Angel Center, the extra need for water was we use water as a therapy. We have a therapy we call hydrotherapy where water is used to calm down children to help in concentration and resilience. So water is a need. And also in families, why we really need extra water to families that have children with special needs is they do a lot of washing. If you have a child with cerebral palsy who is not yet toilet trained, that means most families cannot afford pampers, but we can afford reusable pampers, meaning that every day there's washing. Every day you have to wash bed sheets. So you need water. Every day you have to, you know, to feed, to wash the baby, but also for families that have children with autism, they love water. So there should be a provision of water playing. Africa is hot. So being naked and splashing some water is very good to calm down children when really they are hyper. So we use water as a therapy, we use water for domestic need, but we need extra water to homes of children with special needs because of the extra need for the extra burden that caregivers have to raise these children in an hygienic environment. Then we emphasize hygiene so much because uh, we realize that uh, if we don't address issues of hygiene, disability can be coupled with other challenges like corolla, sanitation related diseases, which are also very common with children with special needs. For example, diarrhea, mm -hmm. dysentery, all these challenges are so common in these families. Actually, in our home visit, as soon as you get there, there is a health issue. There is a health challenge. There is so much typhoid. Why? Because the water is not treated. Here you treat water, you open your taps and water is there. In Africa, it's different. To treat water in Africa, it's another huge project. So the way we treat our water is by boiling, which requires fuel. Where households do not have money to have fuel. So that's why we keep on cutting trees. Yes, we were joking with my professor. He was saying, I'm growing trees because in Uganda, we cut so much trees. And I asked him a question that, Mr. Professor, what alternatives has the government given to households not for fuel, not to cut the trees, and there's nothing. So telling the Ugandan community, stop cutting down trees for fuel to cook food, you should put an alternative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the driving force is so much. Water has to be boiled. And so that's why we see that um, here UNICEF comes in so handy. We, we haven't had any partnership with UNICEF via children with disabilities. And so I'm glad I'm in this podium and I'm talking about this, uh, we need to find out the, the disability working group under UNICEF in Uganda. 
should also look into immunization. Children with disabilities are not immunized. And that's why you see there, in fact, mortality rates are high. Why? There is so much stigma. So the mother fears to even take the child to the health center to receive vaccine. Even if UNICEF is vaccinating uh, and there is no special advocacy to encourage mothers who have children with disabilities to go to the health center for vaccination, our children will remain unvaccinated and they will die of diseases, the, 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 the six killer diseases of where vaccines can help a lot. So I think this is really a very good platform where we are going to discuss about pertinent issues, this time with disability. Why are our children not registered at birth? Once the, the medical system declares that this child has a disability, what do they do afterwards? Why do they send us back home with a child you know that has, ha, has cerebral pulse, has Down syndrome, you know, without diagnosing and supporting the caregivers? And that's why when they reach home, the community will give a diagnosis. The community is which part? You know, the, the community will always give a diagnosis. If the medical system cannot give a diagnosis, the community will give a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So right now, uh, Angel Center, we are putting up a sanitation facility, but it's an adaptable, inclusive sanitation facility where wheelchair users will access grab bars. It is such a kind of technology that we want to explore in our country to, to help us do it, to, to, to help us manage issues of sanitation. Grab bars in the toilet. A, wheel, a child in, in a wheelchair, are there grab bars you know, in the toilet? Uh, is the space big enough to allow a wheelchair turn within the toilet or have the enough water in the sanitation? So, and also waste, the, the, the waste disposal management. We just realize homes that have children that are using pampers, let's say for 20 years, your child is using pampers. How are we supporting them in terms of safe disposal and waste management? Those are areas uh, that we are here to talk about and discuss. There's that extra need in a household that has a child with special needs. So as UNICEF, how are we supported? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we recently had an opportunity to have a van that helps us to, you know, to transport our children to recreation activities. So um, we have, we, recreation activities are very key, but also one of the major reasons why we needed a van was for access to healthcare. If we have, if you're a child and you're at Angel Center and it's a vaccine day, we put all our children in the van and we take them to the health center. But also definitely, how many children in Uganda are able to access that services. Because as I speak right now, Angel Center is full to capacity, but the need is so much there in the communities. So what we do also, because of our community-based program, we mobilize caregivers within the community, and then we go for vaccine. We, this has proved that also children with disabilities, if they receive the vaccine, then their lifespan is longer. There are so many benefits, yeah. Yeah, I talked about uh, advocacy days. As Angel Center, we have seen that some things work and they work best. For example, we come away with the World Down Syndrome Day, the Autism Awareness Day, the World Cerebral Pulse Day, and those are the days when our advocacy is at the top level. This year, we got the opportunity uh, to celebrate the World Down Syndrome Day on the 21st of March, that was last month, where I had a breakfast meeting with the parliamentarians. <coughs> we set up statements and for our country, Uganda, you know, to 
common rights such days, but the most important thing I was presenting to our government, the extra needs and burden of care that households go through. So we want to keep on you know, celebrating those days and we want to let the world know that the needs and the rights of these children should be addressed. Uh, in terms of partnerships and collaborations, I think uh, I'm at the right platform here. Uh, maybe what I didn't mention during, uh, let's say, the World Down Syndrome Day, we have not seen UNICEF coming up. World Autism Day, we have not seen UNICEF coming up. I've seen UNICEF come up on the day of the African child, which is not also inclusive because children born with the African child can also be a child with a disability. Mm -hmm. They have not been incorporated in all those advocacy days. So um, at this platform, moreover in Brussels, I think when we celebrate, let's say, World Down Syndrome Day, and UNICEF comes up and makes a strong statement, I, UNICEF, for the children born with disabilities in Uganda, we stand for you. Let me tell you, the whole world will get that message. When UNICEF comes up, you provide water, but on your water tanks or in your pictures, in your reports, which sometimes I follow, I've not seen a child on a wheelchair trying to collect water. You know, put that picture as UNICEF, incorporate the children born with disabilities for Africa to change. Because even the younger person knows UNICEF, if they see UNICEF coming in, you know, to advocate, to show that we are in for all the children. I strongly believe that's the inclusion. That's why we are here to talk about inclusion. <laughs> and yet I'm very sure UNICEF has something on disability. Yes, it's not really coming out so strongly. And then uh, in terms of partnership, definitely as Angel Center, we try to look for partners that can make our inclusive work quite recognized. And one of the key activities we are looking at is right now inclusive sports. Mm -hmm. And so in um, Special Olympics International in Uganda, uh, we are now partnering with them. Uh, we collaborate with uh, regular schools to come to Angel Center and we have an inclusive sport like basketball in wheelchair. And, and, and it's one of the best amazing days for these children. Mm -hmm. Every child with special needs wants to see another child smile together. And that's the inclusion. And if we are to change the generation in Uganda, including these children in different activities, community participation and engagement, schools, sports, music, dance, and drama, then we are to change the entire generation in Uganda, I think. The next, uh, Angel Center has been in existence for 10 years and I've been pushing this message so hard. But I believe the next generation, 20 years into this, there will be a difference. Mm -hmm. I tell people at the hospital, at the hospital bed when they brought our son that he had Down syndrome. He was the first person in my life to see who had Down syndrome. And I kept on asking the doctors, what am I going to do with this person? What, what is Down syndrome? Imagine the level of ignorance that I had. So if we are to change our generation, we have to start now. Possibly if in my primary school, there were children with Down syndrome I was studying with, if I got my own son, I would be like, oh, this child looks like so-and-so. Our 20 and 2023 plans, of course, we are looking at the construction of an inclusive vocational block that will allow children with intellectual disability, gain skills that will make them more functional and complex in life. Then the provision of center-based studies and more to, to the children, definitely. We are just a drop in an ocean. We still need you know, to do that more. Collaboration with institutions of learning health sector. We are here, we are creating a collaboration with Makera University. We are here at UNICEF. So I think we are meeting our 2023 goals. And then working with caregivers, that's a very strong point. The emotions, uh, our caregivers have burnout. 
they need help, they need support in income generation, in livelihoods, and then raising awareness is still very key. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, Ms. Nambozi, thank you very much for this uh, super interesting presentation. I hope that the people here uh, present enjoyed the presentation too. I wonder if uh, someone here live uh, has a question or if there are any questions in the chat box? No, not for the moment. There are no questions in the chat box. But okay. I, so I think it was a very clear presentation too. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. And there's a question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think this is very interesting that in the same structure you have adults and children. Yes. And I was wondering if you do intergenerational work and what effect does it have uh, on uh, people? Like working uh, adults and children together? Mm -hmm. uh, no, we don't. They don't. Okay. The, how we, we do it, we, we run programs, for example, for the children. Angel Center is more with children best. Yeah. But during holidays, we bring in adults. Okay. And that is also dependent on the funding. Normally, let's say Global, Global Down Syndrome Foundation during, let's say, summertime in America, in Uganda, we are training adults in workforce development. Because no matter, their, their training takes like three months. They come in, let's say, June, we take two weeks, they go back, they come, you know, that's how we do it. Uh, but the, we don't train them concurrently. But in terms of work, definitely the adults, when they are ready to work, they work when also the children are there. But during the training, yeah, we focus on specific time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your question. I see a lot of young uh, people here present. May I ask you, your students? Yes, we are students. And what are what is your study program? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, who can explain which one you are from? I can explain, but not in uh, English. Uh, in okay. English. Uh, we are a school. Um, <laughs> the name is Kirpunt, and um, we are research friendly. Okay. Okay. And, um, yeah, yes. Yeah. Actually, actually, okay. actually, it's under the system of uh, works. Like, uh, we have a uh, class school, they learn uh, with books and they have exams. And, like, we don't learn like this. We have uh, under yes. the It's practice based. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I have to add, I think, yes. like those, uh, that um, I'm following uh, Rose and the project since a lot of years, um, that I have always been very impressed by the progress they have been making. Mm -hmm. And that this time I was just lucky that I was on the road with my students mm -hmm. uh, from so secondary school. So I thought um, this is a group who are particularly interested in everything that is advocacy and uh, standing up against discrimination and those type of things. So some Thursdays we are really working on discrimination and how can yes. I as a youth, as a um, stand up, um, and I think you will see a better example. <laughs> so, we have research that is why we are late. Um, but I really like them to meet you and to see that how people are able to stand up and. Uh, yes, of course. Facing. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. When else came in, I was making a presentation. But I just want to recognize Else. I met Else some good years ago uh, when we were going through a very trying moment. This lady has supported me. You know, she has a program in Gambia. Mm -hmm. And I, when we were starting programs of, um, of construction of Angel Center, I remember I called her. We sat together. 
else you have not seen the new angel center, but you put so much energy in me and I owe you a lot. So when I saw you coming in, I want to appreciate appreciate you before all these people but your energy <laughs> and efforts at that time i didn't i could make it you encouraged me so you are so much welcome and i'm glad i'm seeing you on this platform so we can give it to the next generation now. yes <laughs> so they don't make it this generation is so lucky to have you she's such a powerful lady i appreciate you and i honor you for all the energy and effort you have spent with me over the period of time it's uh, mutual so <laughs> if someone can explain it in dutch so that the friends can understand it properly yes. <laughs> it's a challenge for them yeah. 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 The, um, uh, yeah. Some of them are not. Uh, some of them are French speaking, yeah. Yeah. English, so English uh, yeah, so is not uh, very easy. And anyway, they are not used to it. But some of them, they are working on a, on a new project on discrimination. Yeah. So I think it's important that they. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And have you seen some differences in the way we work with children with disability and how they work? The children with disabilities? Of jullie een stukje uitleg dat we gehoord hebben, of jullie verschil zien over hoe we met mensen met beperkingen omgaan in zo'n project? Of een nieuwe ja. We are more privileged, so we're not as we don't have to be as creative as you have to be, which I think is inspiring. But we have a lot of opportunities, and I think we don't always use them to full extent, but we do get a lot of privileges. Yeah, exactly. Because, Rose, yesterday you were saying the same thing that it's a big difference in approach uh, in the social sciences, mm -hmm. and that the creativity mm -hmm. in Uganda is much bigger because we don't have to think as creatively as. Uh, as we have to, because if we need water, we turn on the the water uh, in the shower, and we have water. <laughs> I I was challenging, um, trying to compare the education in Africa and the education in Europe. That in Africa, because we don't have the resources, you know. Here you talk about opportunities, their opportunities, their resources. So the education in Africa helps us to become more creative because we work within limited, everything is limited. And here, the education is more administrative. You know, your forefathers have set the structure. There is no incidence you will ever say that I didn't read my books because there was no electricity. In Africa, children have to devise means if there's no electricity how do you read your books if there is no water flowing water how do i take a shower so also the environment the environment under which we are raised in africa makes us to become so creative a lot because every time you're in a limited environment with resources you have to plan a lot how do i manage my resource you know to thrive so I'm glad our professor is here. So we're trying to compare the social workers in Africa and the social workers in Europe, their role. And here it's a different role. When you're social work in Uganda, your role is different. It's about community engagement. How do you support the community to access resources? A social work here is working within a government structure that was set so many years ago. The resources are there. So how do I deliver? So, you know, those are the different perspective. Thank you very much. Yes, no. you know, the disadvantage that the system is locking you up and that you are blocked within the system. There are a lot of people now trying to break out of the system and trying to get back that creativity again so that you can do something else and that makes people aware again and thinking yeah. that things are not obvious and things are not is falling out of the sky that you really have to <laughs> well here too people have to think that these are not that obvious okay very thank you <coughs>
thank you for being here. And I propose that we start with your presentation for people online who can't really follow this discussion. We saw we set this discussion further during the lunch. We will have a discussion for this at the end of lunch. We will continue the discussion during the déjeuner. But now we will start the presentation of Professor Eddie Bay. Right. Well, just maybe yeah, a short introduction. So this is uh, Mr. Eddie Walakira, and he's the head of the social department uh, of, of Makerere University in Uganda. And he's here to uh, give us a more academic perspective on inclusive education. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Katerina. Um, uh, thank you so much, host, UNICEF, and Lady Page, and uh, friends who are around here and students, you're most welcome. I'm Eddie Olakia, like Katarina Sage, and I'm honored to be here to give an academic perspective. Already, Rose has given us the more practical um, aspect of promoting inclusion of children with disabilities. I'll um, concentrate mostly on uh, the aspect of education. I think she has been broad and which is very important because each of those elements is necessary if these uh, uh, children are studying. What am I going to uh, talk about? Um, within this presentation, I would like to bring to our attention of the fact that there is a reason why we should be concerned about children, especially with complex disability. Uh, secondly, um, based on the evidence, what do we learn and what does it tell us on what uh, can be done ahead of time? Because normally uh, we find ourselves being reactive, but is it possible to do a lot in terms of prevention so that we balance? Because there is also that, that tendency um, again, briefly, I'll talk about what has been done within Uganda. I work at the university, but I have to look at generally what is it that is being done at the national level and lower levels, and what are the gaps that are remaining, which I refer to as uh, the challenges. Then, possibly, I can give um, some ideas about the way forward. So, in brief, that will be um, uh, my presentation. So why are we really concerned about um, children with complex disabilities, especially uh, if we talk about uh, the education? So if we are to look at uh, the global picture, um, um, the first thing that comes to our attention is that the prevalence levels are high especially in the developing countries. Africa alone has a very big share. And if we come to Uganda, also um, the share is, is quite uh, big. But about 15% of, of the world population has persons who have um, a form of disability. When it comes to children, um, irrespective um, of course, we, we can talk about children between zero to 17 years, about 240 million live with some kind of uh, disability, which is one in 10 uh, of all children uh, at the world stage. Um, Africa and Asia have the biggest proportion, and I don't want to go so much into that because it has um, something it communicates. Um, if specifically we look at Uganda, I was asking my colleagues here, was the population of the region, they told me 11 million. <laughs> uh, Uganda, you had 45 million. Wow. So maybe we need to work on our population. <laughs> the population maybe is too big. They are relative to maybe what we are able to do. <laughs> and this population is boom. It is still growing. So before you know it, we shall be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but anyway, that's the situation. So if you look at the list, test world bank indicators, but surprisingly, 12.5% of this population, uh, which is 
more than 5 million persons have at least one form of disability. This is big. Half of the population of Belgium, if you were to take it, you know, they have a form of disability. This is, this is how big it is. Uh, for children um, who are below Nigeria, population-wise, I think they are more than 50%, um, because they are up to uh, 25 million. So those who have a form of a disability uh, come almost to 2 million. That should be almost one-fifth of the Belgian population, which is still very, very big for children. If you lower it a little bit um, and you talk about adolescents who are 10 to 19 years, 12.5% uh, have uh, at least a mental disorder. Now, if you break these figures further, this is the picture that you get um, that most of the children, um, you know, have a form of mental impairment. And then, 25% will have hearing impairment. Then visual impairment comes in the third you know, uh, position. And then the, the list continues. 4% of these children have what you call multiple impairments. Uh, Rose has able talked about this, and I don't need to shed any more light about it. So this is the picture that we have at the national level. Okay, so what is it that we pick from the situation? Because there are a few points that I want to raise and we challenge our minds, especially uh, balancing in terms of response, uh, prevention as well as uh, response. Now prevalence increases with the age. This is the evidence you have because between two to four years, very few children actually have a form of disability, 4%. But as they grow, the percentage increases. And by, you know, um, 17 years, um, you know, if you come to adults who are 18 years and above, the proportion is 70%. So the implication is that the values of disability can be reduced, uh, particularly with early interventions. We can't thank UNICEF enough because they are the champions. Uh, when they talk about um, early childhood development and what needs to be done, because we know we have this gospel and they have been uh, very active uh, in research and also uh, spreading the gospel around why it is so important. Now, some children are born with the health condition. So that is one aspect, we know, the biology tells us. And others, develop functional impairments due to illness, injury, poverty, malnutrition, and circumstances within the environment. This is the evidence that, that, that we have. Now there is a second point, why it is important to fight poverty. The linkage may not be so explicit, but at least poverty and poor nutrition have a potential to undermine children reaching their full developmental potential. Um, there are some figures there. Africa, up to 66% of the children are at risk. And in Asia, um, half of the children um, are at risk. So that is also a fact. Because, um, you know, um, was it Inge was telling me about somebody who has written a book about stunting. Yeah, yes. that's the camera now. This is a <laughs> yeah. professor and a very famous woman who lives in Uganda uh, at the moment, but she's a Belgian uh, yeah. woman and the stunting program. But that raises you. Yes, the country like Uganda, which has, you know, rainfall two times a year, uh, the soil is fertile. Actually, we grow a lot of food, but some people cannot have mm. enough of it. And stunting is a result of chronic malnutrition. Yes, and it has an effect on brain development. That's true. It has an effect on, on general health. So these are the facts. So when you fight poverty, then maybe you are stepping the ground to make conditions better. The other point is early childhood brain development is affected by poverty and other conditions. And a likely contributor to impaired functioning. I think some research needs to be done 
to establish these facts, but at least there seems to be some bit of linkage. Uh, biological and environmental factors also contribute to, so I have to switch off this one. I don't know how it works here. That's <laughs> can connect. Somewhere in the yeah, I knew it wouldn't go through. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, okay, let's stop here. Um, Sorry for the technical hitch. So annoying. Ah, here it is again. Yeah, updates were instant. Great. What a timing. Very pleasant. Okay. Yeah, we are so sorry for the disruption, uh, technology and disruption. <laughs> for the disruption. <laughs> Yeah. Your cell phone, you know? yeah. uh, but <laughs> we can still at least see how to Okay, here we are again. Sorry for the disruption. Um Okay, um, these are some of the things that, some of the evidence that we can talk about, which cannot be, um, or some of it is still, you know, being developed. But the other point to um, emphasize here is that several neurodevelopmental disorders often coexist within the same child, uh, implying the complexity of care and support the child needs. Now, those of you who have gone to Angel, Angel Center, can test
Uh, people online, can you still hear us? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, sorry again. Yeah. Okay, we are back online, and uh, for us in Africa, we say thanks be to God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah because uh, the computer also was trying to tell us that child needs needs uh, <laughs> that needed to be updated. Yeah. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for being patient with us. Now I have to change to another laptop here. Um, there are several neurodevelopmental disorders that often coexist within the same person, uh, which implies the complexity of care and support that children with disabilities need. And um, Rose has been very uh, helpful to give us that picture uh, based on the work that she's doing. Um, now, when we talk about inclusive education, what exactly are we referring to? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, inclusive education, uh, you must be in a position to recognize that children with special needs have diverse needs and that they require special consideration to enable them access mainstream education. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't recognize that and make it a priority, then it won't make sense. Uh, secondly, it requires creation of an enabling environment by removing social and structural barriers undermining access to education. And if we come to the situation in Uganda, I think you'll have it firsthand that the barriers are many. Here in Belgium, uh, whether uh, in the French speaking of Flemish, I think you've done a lot. And maybe this needs to make a lot of sense. But in many developing countries, um, I think the structure and other barriers are still uh, highly prevalent. Um, the children need uh, to be supported to learn and achieve their full potential without discrimination and exclusion. It's good that uh, your friend is here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, she's doing a program that promotes, you know, um, diversity and inclusion. Yeah, which means it goes beyond uh, disability. Yeah, that's yeah? true. But I think they have the concept and children are one of the groups or individuals who have complex disabilities who are likely to suffer uh, most when it comes to access to services like education. Uh, again, why should we be concerned, especially in the developing countries, Uganda inclusive? Uh, these children face stigma. Um, if we have someone who is doing occupational therapy here and also in and whoever is developed, you can talk about stigma. It's a point that some people commit suicide. It is a mental health issue. You know, it affects your mind, it affects your brain. And um, if people keep talking about you, so if they grow up feeling it and experiencing it, then it's a problem. Also, a problem to the caregivers. Mm -hmm. They are neglected. They are discriminated, obviously discriminated, because some people by nature don't want to be close and even associated. They would rather be very far. It takes a high level of professionalism or a mindset change to accommodate, to receive and work with these children. So as a result, even at the national level, they may face exclusion when it comes to allocation of resources. So it is a very serious issue. So within the family, within the education system, and also among the policymakers, these children face a certain degree of exclusion. But uh, although you said UNICEF has not put these children in uh, you know, uh, some of those days, mm -hmm. I would have to appreciate them and many other agencies because without them, again, we would yeah. not be knowing much of what is 
is going on. And there have been at the front line of uh, changing policies at the nation level. We have an education system within the country that has uh, pre primarily before you go, you join formal education. Uh, and that form of education in Uganda is not, okay, the government has put policies in place, but the government doesn't really invest resources in pre primary before you start the formal education and primary one, et cetera. But research shows that up to 28% uh, of these children who are doing pre-primary education have a form of mental impairment, you know, which is very challenging. Um, within the education system, we have uh, almost 8 million children who are attending um, uh, education classes from primary one uh, to primary seven. 170 um, almost, you know, have special needs. This is a big chunk of the population. But if you look at um, enrollment levels, I think it is actually a very small number of those who are attending mainstream education. So which means many of them are outside there. A few are in Angel Center and a few other schools, but majority do not have um, access uh, to education. Okay, so, and we, we have done a study. I'm, I'm privileged to have been uh, the leader of this uh, study. Uh, the Minister of Education commissioned us to look at uh, reasons why um, uh, children are not in school and to pay particular attention to the issue of school charges. <clears throat> now, when we did a survey, a uh, countrywide survey uh, involving almost 6,000 households, um, we were able to establish that 19,759 um, young people and children are within the school going age. Uh, from our point of view, we used five years to 20 years. For 20 years, they at least at the university. Now, the enrollment was 79.2%. It is still high, even though COVID has had negative effect. That is now for the general population of these uh, households, I mean, children within these households. However, from this broad population, 3.2% of the children um, mm -hmm. had a form of disability. Um, but the general population now, of course, it is 12.5. Um, for these kids, it would be around maybe 10% or even more. What does that imply? That very few of children with complex, um, especially disabilities, are attending school. Yeah. Now, generally, if you give it a very generous proportion of these children from zero, I mean, from um, say five to 20, who have um, a disability and you put it at 7%, which is very low, should be around 10% or so, less than half are enrolled. So this should be a matter of concern because these are facts. So very few are accessing education. Um, from the international perspective and also from the domesticated uh, uh, policy and legal environment, we know that it's a right to access education. But these kids are not accessing education, quite a number. And the UNCRC uh, specifies this very clearly. So for purposes of time, I don't want to read it again. Again, we understand that within the sustainable development uh, goals, goal number four is very specific and to read it, um, Nation states must ensure inclusive and equitable quality education <laughs> and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Where are we as a nation? Mm -hmm. Here, we may have made a lot of progress, but what about these countries which are still uh, uh, developing? And what are the barriers and what needs to be done? Uganda as a country has also played some role. Just created um, a policy environment, I think, which to some extent is supportive. Uh, some of the initiatives can be seen as far back as 1992, <laughs> and has specific provisions on inclusive education. 
But how far we have gone, this is something we can determine in the next uh, few uh, minutes. The Constitution, at least, um, provides for the rights of children with complex disabilities. And one of, the, um, one of the provisions is that all persons have a right to education, irrespective of your religious background, of your physical and mental situation, you have a right to education. Uh, specifically, children are entitled to basic education. But then you'll discover that although they're entitled, time comes that they can't access this education. There is, um, what is very fascinating is that there is an education which was uh, enacted in 2008. But this Education Act, if you look at it very closely, it doesn't make it mandatory for children to, re uh, you know, to receive education because there will be penalties for a parent who doesn't take a child to school. So there is a gap within this law which caregivers at the family level exploit. In some countries like Rwanda, I think they will ask you a question, why is your child not attending school? And we have not reached that point. I don't know whether we are running out from the costs involved from having all of these children at school. But if the children who do not have um, challenges, uh, disabilities, can also uh, be, you know, you can drop out of school at an early age, what about these that have complex disabilities? The situation will likely to be uh, even worse. There is the Disability Act, like I've said, the legal and the policy system, I think, is quite generous. And Uganda has ratified these instruments, so we are in good books with UNICEF and other uh, you know, international agencies that you know, promote uh, this right uh, to access education. But most importantly, I think, as a way really to put this into practice, the government created a department uh, responsible for special needs and inclusive education under the Ministry of Education and Sports. It has a mission, uh, learners with special needs, um, accessing quality education services equitable. It has also a vision, a mission, and also a purpose for its establishment. When you read all of this, it is quite impressive and attractive. But like we normally say, sometimes some people are so good, you know, it comes to talking, yeah? But when it comes to practice, that is when you see the difference between words and action. And I think it is uh, what communicates exactly what is going on on the ground. Um, however, this, you know, uh, in spite of some of the challenges, there are some achievements that have been registered. One of them is increased enrollment, participation and completion of schooling by persons with special learning needs. This is um, I think they, met, they, they provide it as an, ob, an objective, but also when I read some of the literature over a number of years, the enrollment levels have been increasing, although at a slow pace. Uh, then this department again aims to strengthen and systemize existing initiatives. Uh, I wish they could come to Angel Center and some other um, non government organizations which are doing excellent work. Uh, but as their capacity grows, I think this is part of their plan that they can develop some standard procedures and methods and also support uh, in every way possible uh, these children to access uh, education. They want more stakeholders to participate and also they want to make sure that um, there are supporting programs uh, for children with special needs. The learning environment, it is almost like a song. Everybody talks about it. Uh, some work is ongoing. When I talked to the Commissioner for Special Needs in the Ministry of Education, they have said, they, she told me, yes, there is something going on and we are doing some work in this line. But as you know, we have competing needs uh, because we still have to struggle to make the learning environment even conducive for everyone. But when it comes to special needs, it is a few pockets here and there. So a lot remains to be done. Uh, specialized services, there is also something they are doing about this, especially um, providing sign language interpreters. At Makere, there is something that um, is okay. 
uh, because we have uh, at the university level, let me just give this as an example, because these ones I've lived with them uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the government actually offers uh, some support uh, services for these uh, students. They can give an interpreter or a person takes them around uh, and equipment here and there. But then over time, I've discovered that as numbers increased, these services, you know, reduced and sometimes almost vanished. A few still receive some of the services like a person who can take them around. But it's not something that you think, you will think that it is uh, available some degree of adequacy. And I don't know what is going on in some other universities because it is very complicated. The demands are too much. Uh, you need to pay a salary to this person to do this work. So if for the common civil servant, uh, salaries, although they are paid, uh, you'll hear that they need to be increased. Then you have to add on salaries for special assistance. So it is a challenge that the government finds this all uh, experience. But I was told there is a disability fund at the district level, lower levels. Here, if you have a province, Flanders or uh, Bra Brussels as a big city, but if you break up to the third level, I think from the city, Brussels, then you go to another, but the lower level, they have provided a fund for persons with disabilities. But this fund is only accessible to those who are able <laughs> to run to the district, <laughs> who are able to associate. Now, those with complex disabilities, and who are able to think about yeah. creative mm -hmm. programs, mm -hmm. where does it leave those with complex yeah. disabilities? With the intellectual expression. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes, intellectual. So it is also a challenge. Uh, some something to do with the teaching methods is being done at specialized rooms, but these are interventions that are not mainstream the country right? yeah. because of the resources. Something is being done. Um, in particular, and this is very crucial, the government has introduced a new curriculum for students from senior one up to senior four, and also they're introducing another curriculum. I don't know, primary education has it changed a lot? Uh, the curriculum, yes. yeah, it, uh, it also can yes, keeps in. But mm. the National Curriculum Development Center, based on some of the interactions, has to develop a package of inclusive education. Uh, Rose told me that her son is attending an international school. There is, it is, it provides mainstream education. Mm. But within this mainstream education, there is a well systematic package that makes the student fit into the system and also continue learning. He may not actually be at the same level like the rest of the students, yeah. but something has been done. But yes, so the curriculum development center, I think went looks at all of these needs and challenges, it says, no, we better now try to make it possible. It is difficult. That package is not in place. We need more information about uh, these children, and it is a challenge. We need more qualified teachers. It is also a challenge. Um, the schools, if you are to count them, that provide services uh, for children with special needs, you count them from them. They are just a handful. For a population of 45, with about 5 million who have a disability, and maybe a big percentage of those special needs maybe grants. Very so the infrastructure, um, the funding, and um, and overall the outlook of what you can call a complete inclusive education system are things that we still have to contend uh, with. Okay, so. If now we bring it more to the level of gross and give practical examples, um, many uh, special needs students can hardly fit into the mainstream education because one, they need one on one support, which they are not able to get. Mm -hmm. uh, there must be teachers who will say one of the students. The teachers themselves, the moment they interact with these children, they get stressed and they become a mentor. You know, people who need mentors to support. 
It's difficult. Mm -hmm. If parents can be stressed, what about teachers? Yeah. When you're teaching, somebody's running and hitting something. <laughs> so it is not an easy thing. And not everybody is, is able really to handle the children. They need assistance. This has done some work to support your students. These are things that hardly reach even one third of the those that need mm -hmm. these services. I talked to um, someone who works with an organization. The name it has Mokisa Foundation, then uh, Don Idoni Center. They offer almost similar services like uh, what uh, Angel Center does. But if you hear the stories of particular categories of children, then you know that it is not easy. Continuous lifetime medical treatment. When the medicines are hardly accessible, they are very expensive. So, what can a parent do? What will the government do? From a policy point of view, the government, I think, would ideally remove all the taxes and make this medication accessible. But the voice of advocacy looks like it's still weak. Nobody has internalized it and made it like free things to access. Very, very difficult. Others need facilities. She talked about diapers. Yes. Yeah, some of them are reusable. Yeah. But these are things they need on a daily basis. Difficult situations uh, with the facilities, with equipment, that they are hardly available in school settings. <clears throat> Private sector actors are not supported. If I was to ask Rose, okay, the policy allows her to operate. What else are you being supported to do? Because ideally, um, there would be a fund to support this that offer these services, but this funding won't be based. Okay, what's the way forward? We have the medical model which is very paramount but also uh, and very critical but looks like because of stigmatization exclusion it looks like predominantly we need to innovate especially to bring on board and, and innovate and have a social model which is more systematic where you know uh, parents and the communities can take responsibilities and they are made aware that these are people who have rights, who need access to resources, and as many people as possible also to get involved in their upbringing. And I think from my point of research, this is where we are still lacking. When you look at different forms of care for children, additionally, the alternative care system uh, or the kinship system, there is a way within communities that parents and communities will look after their children. But these ones are, to some extent, excluded, especially those with severe forms of disability. Why? Because the mindset is still um, a difficult mindset that connects these children to bad omens. When it talks about massacring, that is where it comes in, to forms of beliefs that people think that the moment you have a child of this situation, then the entire family is cursed. Or you did something that it was so complicated. Or you need to sacrifice something. So if you are not lucky, your, your child uh, who actually doesn't have a disability may become you know, uh, a sacrifice because someone thinks that's the only way to deal with it. So engagement with the communities needs to be thought about and to bring about an integration between what has worked already and also a strong community involvement. Okay, thank you so much uh, for listening. So thanks to our speakers. Thank you, Rosemary Mary and Eddie for being here with us. Thank you, Catherine, for moderating this session. Thanks to Ho West um, for uh, organization of this session with uh, in collaboration with Educate, and thanks to UNICEF for uh, letting us using their office today. And thank you, students, for being here with us. It's uh, really a pleasure to have young people. And you talked about the next generation, so that's really important. So thank you. And